Hey guys, uh, we're going to do photosynthesis. It's going to take two pages here. Um, it might be a long one. Like I said, on the Google Doc, uh, this unit is a particularly difficult just because photosynthesis and cell respiration are a little difficult to understand. So take your time, pause the video when you need to, make sure that you're um, reviewing stuff, taking breaks, etc. All right. Uh, so I'm going to use a left side and a right side, and we can just title this photosynthesis. So we're going to kind of encompass everything we've talked about so far in terms of chemical reactions, exergonic, endergonic, enzymes, and we're going to now focus on metabolism. So how organisms are processing energy, creating energy, creating organic molecules for themselves. So we're going to start with plants, um, our autotrophs, uh, and so they utilize photosynthesis. So photo is the root, which is representing the energy source. So we're going to use light energy, photo. And that light energy is going to be harnessed to synthesize or create organic molecules. And when we say organic molecules, we're talking about our big macromolecules. So for photosynthesis, they create glucose, but then plants can take that glucose and repackage it and create proteins, amino acids, uh, lipids, or nucleic acids for themselves. So the overall chemical reaction for photosynthesis, it is an endergonic reaction. So it has a positive delta G. It requires an input of energy. Without that input of energy, photosynthesis will not occur. So the reactants for photosynthesis are, you take six molecules of water, reacted with six molecules of carbon dioxide, and that will yield one molecule of glucose and six molecules of oxygen. So like I said, this is an endergonic reaction. So entropy is decreasing because we're taking 12 of these smaller molecules and we're creating a really highly organized molecule. So our delta S or entropy has decreased um, and then the enthalpy has over here. So we have an increase in enthalpy. So we would have an endergonic reaction. Let me try to find where that page is. Oh, there's a cat on my desk. Uh, so photosynthesis would look like this, where we take our reactants, which are low energy levels, and we're going to push them to their transition state, and then they will become the products up here, which would be our glucose and our oxygen. So we're going to have to add in a lot of activation energy to get these reactants to an unstable transition state, and that energy is in the form of um, light energy. So let's just kind of go over... I need to move my cat. Uh, let's just kind of go over where we get all of these reactants and products from and to. So remember the water will always come into a plant through its roots. So we're gonna harness water from the soil. Some of you are kind of still having the misconception that water enters a plant through its stomata. Um, we'll have gas exchange. You'll have some water vapor exchange, but it won't be enough to power photosynthesis or help the plant grow. So the bulk of water will transmit through the roots. Uh, this gas right here, the CO2, gas exchange occurs over the stomata. So this will occur through the stomata. Okay. Um, this glucose, once it's created, uh, it will go to the mitochondria for cellular respiration to occur. So it can do a few things. Um, so first it could, uh, be transported to the mitochondria. Because remember, autotrophs have both mitochondria and the chloroplasts. So then go to the mitochondria and once they get there, they can be used for cellular respiration. Which we'll go over later in the week. And from cellular respiration, we'll just take that glucose and break it down into usable ATP. Um, they could also just use this glucose directly to make macromolecules, um, or they can keep it as glucose because they need to make um, cellulose for their cell walls. Uh, so it can just go into growth and development of the individual plant. 
chain. Stop. Okay. This oxygen is essentially a waste product, so it'll typically get released through the stomata. Unless the plant hasn't um, had oxygen for a while, then it'll be used for respiration. So both of these products can be used to power cellular respiration. So we can either use it for respiration, cellular respiration, <clears throat> or it could be used, uh, sorry, released through the stomata as a waste product. This is why, and like, you know this, like that trees oxygenated our atmosphere or cyanobacteria oxygenated our atmosphere because when they developed the process of photosynthesis, there was this net output of oxygen and that oxygen was released to our atmospheres, which uh, increased the oxygen content so that we could have terrestrial life on earth. So there's all these different types of plants. The bulk of the plants that we know of, because we live in a pretty temperate region of America, of the world, are called C3 plants. There are other plants called C4 plants and other plants called CAM plants, which we're going to talk about later. So this chemical equation for photosynthesis only applies to C3 plants. The reason these plants are called C3 plants is because their products are three carbon molecules. So when these plants actually finish photosynthesis, they don't actually make an entire glucose molecule. They make two molecules that are C3 molecules, and then those two C3 molecules will bond to make one molecule with six carbons or a glucose. So C3 plants make eventually glucose, uh, the C4 plants will make a four carbon byproduct and then CAM plants will just run photosynthesis uh, differently to ensure that they survive in their particular environment. So C3 plants produce three carbon molecules. So their, their molecule products will all have three carbons. All right, uh, photosynthesis essentially has two steps. Uh, the first step is called the light reaction. I'm going to leave some space. We're going to kind of flip flop between this and the next page. And then the second reaction is called the Calvin cycle. It's named after a man named Melvin Calvin. He's the one who kind of uh, figured out the details and the intricate steps of the Calvin cycle. So for each of these steps, you need to know the reactants and the products, the reactants and the products. You should know where they occur in the chloroplast, and you should know in general what the processes are. You do not need to know particular molecules. You don't need to know enzymes, pretty much. You just need to know what goes in, what comes out, and like what does that do for the plant. So over here, we're going to turn our notebook's landscape. And essentially, uh, up in this corner, we're going to draw a smaller chloroplast, and then your whole book is going to become a large chloroplast. So if you remember, chloroplasts actually have triple membranes, because um, <clears throat> they started with a double membrane, and then they were engulfed, so they got a triple membrane. So a chloroplast will have an outer membrane, and it'll have an inner membrane. And then its very inner membrane will be highly folded. And it's highly folded in such a way that it makes these stacks of disc-shaped membrane organelle-like structures. And they kind of look like stacks of pancakes. So I usually just draw them like this, little stacks of pancakes on top of each other. And they're all interconnected, so they'll be connected to other little stacks of pancakes like so. So everything we drew in red is a membrane. <clears throat> And then we have different names for kind of all these different regions. So we have two areas with fluid. Zoom in a little bit. So right here, this inner area with fluid, this fluid is called the stroma. And then you have fluid that is inside our little disc. So this membrane is separating this outer environment from this inner environment. And this inner environment fluid is called the lumen. OK. 
okay? Uh, and then we, when we look at these membrane structures, if you're looking at an entire structure of all the membrane discs all together, that's called a granum. And if you're looking at a single disc within a granum, that's called a thylakoid. Okay, so when we talk about <clears throat> photosynthesis, the light reaction and the Calvin cycle take place in different parts of the chloroplast. And the purpose of having all these membrane structures is it separates our processes. So now we can have a really efficient light reaction occur, and then we can have all of our Calvin cycle occur in a different area so that we're organizing all the enzymes, all the proteins, all the molecules into really specific compartments. Um, and then you can see the, <clears throat> the thylakoid membrane is highly folded, so we're increasing our surface area. So the more folds you have in the thylakoid, the more light reactions can occur. So you have more photosynthesis occurring in a unit of time. Okay, so we're gonna make essentially this entire paper a giant chloroplast, okay? So this is kind of like our inlay. Uh, we can kind of box that guy off. So we're gonna draw a granum, and then the rest of our paper is gonna be stroma. So let's draw it like, let's just do like a two thylakoid grana. Cute. All right, so remember, one single of these is my thylakoid. So this is a thylakoid or the thylakoid membrane. The inner fluid of a thylakoid is referred to as the lumen. Let's write it over here so we don't take up too much space. And then the fluid outside of the uh, granum and thylakoids is known as the stroma. So let's write that over here. So our two cycles, the light reaction and the Calvin cycle occur in our different areas. So the light reaction occurs here along the thylakoid and our Calvin cycle occurs out here in the stroma. So we're gonna kind of divide our two steps into those two areas. So let's just kind of draw a dividing line showing our division between our two big steps. Let's just draw it right here. So if I draw something across the line, that means it's gonna move from this cycle to this cycle. Or if I move it over here, it's going from this cycle to this cycle. So over here on the left, we're gonna be drawing the light reaction. And this reaction is referred to as the light reaction because it is the part that requires light. So this is the part where we're uh, taking light energy from the sun. And then the Calvin cycle is where we are creating our glucose molecules. This is not conducive to work. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so, um, essentially, how the chloroplast harnesses light energy is it utilizes proteins. And so, in this membrane, across the membrane, we're going to have multiple membrane structures. So, we're going to have. We're just going to draw a few. Um, we're only going to. We're going to just draw them like ovals to make it a little bit simple. So everything we're drawing in uh, this orangish red, these are all different proteins. So we have a few integral proteins. They span the whole membrane. Uh, you're gonna have a peripheral protein over here. And then maybe on our second thylakoid, you're gonna have a very special shaped protein and it does really look like this. It kind of looks like a butternut squash. So it'll have a rounder side like so and then a more oblong side. And it's also an integral transmembrane protein. So it's kind of these integral transmembrane proteins are able to access molecules outside but also inside the thylakoids. Or they can also be transporting things in and out. So these can be transport proteins um, or just for cell communication. So let's kind of name these guys. Um, this first protein here is called photosystem 2. Okay, uh, this second one over here is called photosystem one. 
The reason that they are numbered out of order is they were no, uh, numbered in the order that they were discovered. So photosystem one, this one was discovered first and they thought that these were the only components of photosynthesis. And then they realized there is another photosystem. It does occur before uh, photosystem one, but they still just named it photosystem two. So a photosystem is a complex of proteins. So it's a protein complex meaning it's composed of many different types of proteins. And the different types of proteins that are in this protein complex are there are protein pumps. So if you remember, anytime you see the word pump, it means that something is gonna be moved from low to high concentration. So we're gonna have some active transport. To do that, they need energy. They're gonna get that energy from light or from the sun. So these proton pumps are going to be moving things from low concentration to high concentration. In order to do that, they're going to need an input of energy. The second thing that is located in these photosystems are more proteins, uh, and these proteins are called pigments. Okay, um, so you guys probably know of chlorophyll. So there's multiple types of chlorophyll. There's chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B. There's also accessory pigments like xanthophylls, uh, keratins. So all these pigments, their purpose as proteins is they absorb light energy. So when we need energy to power these proton protein pumps, these protein pumps are getting their energy from the pigments that are also found within their complex. So these absorb light energy. And they all absorb different wavelengths of light. So we have your visible light spectrum. Um, red has the longest wavelength. Violet has your shortest wavelength. So chlorophyll A's and chlorophyll B's, they're the most abundant chlorophyll or pigments in your plants. And they absorb mostly in the red spectrum and the blue spectrum, and they don't absorb the green. So because they don't absorb green, they reflect green. And so that's why plants appear green to our eye. So it's the the spectrum of light that's not being absorbed. Xanthophylls and carotenoids, they'll absorb at different wavelengths and then they'll make um, plants appear different colors. Like carotenoids typically make plants appear orangish. So in fall, when the leaves turn color from greens to oranges, it's because you have more xanthophylls and carotenoids than you do chlorophylls because the plants drop their leaves in the winter when there's less sunlight to preserve energy. So they kind of go dormant in the winter and then once the sun comes back they'll pick photosynthesis back up they'll grow their leaves they'll be green again so that's our photosystem so photosystem 2 and photosystem 1 are made of these two things um this guy right here is just another proton protein pump i keep saying proton protein pump so we have multiple protein pumps um, and they all need to be powered by energy so they all need an input of energy and then they can all pump things against their gradient from high to low. Um, this last enzyme here, this is called NADP plus reductase. So if you remember, all enzymes end in ACE. So what this enzyme, enzyme does is it catalyzes the reaction of reducing NADP plus. So this last, so many enzymes, this one here is called ATP synthase. It's another enzyme, it's an ACE, and this is a uh, enzyme that allows the synthesis of proteins, sorry, synthesis of ATP. So we're going to generate energy, it's going to be generated here, and then that energy is going to be used to power our Kelvin cycle. So essentially what we're going to do is let's kind of set up where our concentrations are of molecules and then we'll kind of run through photosynthesis. So to start, a plant typically has a more acidic environment in its thylakoid. So because the lumen is more acidic, that means it has a higher concentration of hydrogen ions. And it just maintains this pH differential across its membrane so that we can always have this movement of these protons. So we're just going to assume these are protons. They're carrying a single proton with them. 
And when we move these protons against their gradient, it's going to allow for us to start generating energy. And I'll kind of go over how. So we have a higher concentration of hydrogen ions in the lumen. We have a lower concentration of hydrogens outside the lumen. Okay, so all these pumps we've talked about, so this photosystem two, this pump, photosystem one, all of them are going to be pumping hydrogens in because they're all going to be pumping from low to high concentration. They can't pump unless they have an input of energy. So essentially what happens is everything starts with water. Let me try to find a pen. So water is going to come and there is a um, binding site on photosystem two for water. And there's an enzyme here that splits water. It's a hydrogenase. So water is going to bind to this protein, photosystem two, and then the enzyme is going to catalyze the, catalyze the splitting of water. So water is going to get split into, um, well, Let's see how we're going to write this. Uh, one half molecule of O2, so there's just one oxygen, um, and then hydrogen ions. Okay, so we're going to split water. You're going to get multiple hydrogen ions. I'm just going to write it here. Um, and so that's kind of how we're building up this concentration of hydrogens is by splitting water. So our very first step is water will split. When water splits, the reason that this oxygen is not bound to this hydrogen anymore is because this water lost its electrons or it was oxidized. So very quickly, we kind of have to review a redox reaction. So if you remember from chemistry, your favorite thing, uh, we have redox reactions. Here, let's write this over here on this side. Um, and a redox reaction, I'm just going to write it in this little space for us is a reduction and an oxidation reaction. So you should remember that reduction, if something is reduced, it means that it gained electrons. Okay, if something is oxidized, it means that it lost its electrons. So essentially, we're going to be transferring electrons from water. We're going to be energizing those electrons and then passing them through photosynthesis until we can place those high energy electrons into the glucose molecule. So we're taking electrons from water and those electrons are going to end up in this glucose molecule. So water is being oxidized. It's going to lose its electrons and eventually we're going to be reducing glucose. So the acronym to remember, you could do LEO says GER, so loses electrons is oxidation, gains electrons is reduction, so LEO the lion says GER. There's also oil rigs, so oxidation is loss, reduction is gain, whichever way helps you remember. So let's kind of go back here. So our water was oxidized, it's going to lose its electrons. Those electrons are now here. They're uh, bound to our photosystem too. So I'm just gonna say we have low energy electrons. We're just gonna call them low electrons. They have low energy because water is a generally low energy molecule. It has low enthalpy. And so these energies also have low energy. So we're gonna excite them because if we excite these electrons, we can actually get enough energy in these electrons so they can do two things. They themselves can move so we can have mechanical energy. Uh, but they can also power the proton pump here to start pumping protons against their gradient. So essentially we need to add energy to these electrons. An easy way to excite electrons is to utilize light energy. So photosystem two also has these pigments. So those pigments are going to absorb light energy. We're just going to draw them as like little lightning bolts. So that light energy is going to be absorbed by the pigments. That energy is going to be transferred to these electrons and the electrons like literally move to the top of our photosystem too as they're becoming high energy electrons. Here, let's put high E electrons, high energy, low energy electrons. 
So we went from low energy electrons from water, we excited them with light energy. When we excited them with light energy, they gave off enough energy to power this pump. So now this proton com protein complex with a protein pump can pump some hydrogens against its gradient. So it's gonna take hydrogens from outside with our lower hydrogen ion concentration and it's gonna pump them into the lumen, okay? So against the gradient. So we can only do that once we have excited these electrons. These electrons will then move. So the this is called the electron transport chain. So you're gonna transport your electrons from one protein to the next in a chain reaction. The reason that the electrons move from one to the next is because we get more electronegative as we move down. So this protein is the least electronegative, but it's also the only protein that has the active site to bond water. So water can't bind to any of these. So it kind of has to start here. And then the electrons will move sequentially. So this will have a higher electronegativity. So now our electrons will just be transported. They'll be attracted to our protein pump more. So our electrons are here now. When our electrons are here, they are providing just enough energy for this protein pump to pump hydrogen against its gradient. Okay, this one won't be pumping anymore because the electrons aren't there anymore. So you kind of get to pump the electron, pump the hydrogens only when the electrons are at your complex. The electrons will move again. So this photosystem one has a higher electronegativity than our protein pump, so they will move over here. Each time the electrons move, they're actually losing energy because they're using kinetic energy and then it's being lost as thermal or heat energy. And so by the time they get to photosystem two, they're back to a low energy state. So we have low energy electrons again. The good thing is photosystem one also has these pigments that can absorb light energy. So we'll just take some light energy. The pigments will absorb it They'll transfer that light energy to our electrons and we're gonna create high energy electrons again. Once we have a high energy state here, then this photosystem one can also pump hydrogens against their gradient. So we've kind of done a few things. We have oxidized water, so we've taken water's electrons. So these electrons that are now here at photosystem one originated from water that we split. We've pumped hydrogens into the lumen, so we're kind of increasing the concentration of our lumen, decreasing the concentration of our um, stroma. And there's a really strong purpose for that, we'll go over it. And these high energy electrons now can be used to create high energy molecules. So these high energy electrons are now gonna to move to their last uh, protein in the electron transport chain. And this is called NADP reductase. What NADP is, is it is a molecule that can um, be reduced. So we can reduce this molecule and we can give it these high energy electrons and it can store those high energy electrons and transfer them somewhere else. So they're known as electron shuttles. So let's kind of add it to this little guy over here. So we have these molecules called electron shuttles. And essentially what they do is they are uh, they get reduced, so they will gain these high energy electrons, and then they will shuttle them to another area of the chloroplast, and then eventually they'll be oxidized, so they'll lose those electrons, and then they'll give them to our product. So how are we gonna get these high energy electrons from water into this glucose? We're gonna use a shuttle as our transporter between those molecules. So essentially we have a chemical reaction occurring here. We're gonna take NADP plus, meaning it has one more proton than electron. We're gonna add into this some hydrogen ions, some free hydrogen ions that are just free floating in the stroma and the lumen. And then we're also gonna take uh, two electrons. And those two electrons came from water. So that's our electron pair. And then once we've added in the electrons and the hydrogen ion, we can create a molecule called NADPH. So here's the hydrogen ion we added in. And then those two electrons are here. 
and they're being shared between NADP and the hydrogen ion. So this is our electron shuttle. So it's grabbing those electrons from here that came from water and then we're gonna shuttle it over to the Calvin cycle. So this enzyme, the NADP plus reductase, is the enzyme that will reduce our NADP, which is what we drew right over here. This is reduction, it's gained electrons. So this enzyme here, let's pick a different color, is gonna take NADP plus, and it's gonna convert it, we're gonna go over the line, it's gonna convert it into NADPH. Now remember, we're going to have now the electrons that were here were transported to this enzyme. Those high energy electrons are now right here. Those are the electron pair. So the electrons that originated from water are now in our electron shuttle. The second thing that's gonna occur here is we've pumped in all this hydrogen. So now the lumen has a really high concentration of hydrogen. The only way for diffusion to occur, so remember diffusion is passive transport, it goes from high concentration to low concentration, is through our ATP synthase. So the ATP synthase is not only an enzyme, it is also a protein channel. So remember channels can be open and shut, and so they will just allow for simple diffusion. So they move things from high concentration to low concentration. All right, I'm gonna take a break. I'll be right back. <laughs> 